Thank you. Your clicker, if you've got a presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes, like he said, my name is Michael Ware. <clears throat> I am an exclusive SCR consultant for Thompson Industrial Services as well as the president of SCR Solutions. Um, my background <clears throat> in, the in the power industry started in 2000 when I was an entry tech for a vendor that had the contract at Clifty Creek Power Plant, is, which is AEP plant in Madison, Indiana. I started working as a technical consultant uh, on SCRs as a result of that job in 2003 when they installed SCR systems in the Clifty Creek Power Plant. At that point, I was the project manager and I was challenged to come up with ways to clean the SCRs, particularly online, and we were cleaning them online in bypass at the time. And along the route, I had come up with a way to clean the SCRs in situ that was a pretty effective process. Um, since 2003, I've worked as a director, project manager, SCR consultant for several contractors in the United States as well as some in Germany and in China. Um, so that's me. Hold on, let me see if I how this. So my experience really uh, is limited to just SCRs, and as impressed as I am by some of the topics and things that have been covered here, the fact is that SCRs currently right now are one of the first, uh, how you try to say, most prevalent NOx controls being used right now today. So um, my focus is more on the maintenance of SCRs and the SCR reactors, and particularly the SCR catalyst, in the belief that optimal performance of SCRs are, how can you say, dependent upon their proper maintenance. Um, and as we all know, if you operate SCRs, there's a lot of things that are put into SCRs such as the ESPs and the large particle ash screens that are supposed to stop the ash carryover from the boiler into the SCR system or from stopping them from clogging onto the SCR catalyst. But in spite of those things, a certain amount of fly ash tends to carry over and in some cases quite a bit. And that those contaminants can lead to an increase in several problems with your SCR, including the system pressure loss, um, suboptimal performance, uneven ammonia distribution, and can cause ammonia slip. And anybody familiar with SCRs know that ammonia slip, when mixed with the SO3, can lead to the ammonia bisulfate buildup downstream, particularly on the air heaters. Um, so these are all problems with the SCRs um, that we face when running SCRs. And there's a few examples here of types of ash plugage. Everybody thinks of popcorn ash as being a major plugging issue with SCRs. But in addition to that, there's also just fi fine particle ash, fly ash, that does tend to clog SCRs over a period of time. And uh, we've run into some cases where there's even a magnesium oxide. I find that magnesium oxide generally doesn't plug the SCRs so well unless it's left on check for a period of time, but what it does tend to do is uh, blind the surface layers of the inside of the catalyst. And even though you may, especially if you have a bigger pitched catalyst, you may not feel it like say with back pressure in the unit like you would see in some others without uh, magnesium. But what it tends to do is allow the system to flow through there, but it blinds the catalyst walls, and therefore a certain amount of ammonia is not able to uh, react to the surface of the catalyst, and therefore you tend to have a little bit more ammonia slip. And, and I think that, like, speak, listening to some of this about uh, mercury control and the different things that are being done with coal and uh, whatnot, that there's a lot of new things like that coming up that would affect your SCRs. Um, that we're traditionally not looking at. And this all lends to the fact that um, whether it's plugged by fly ash or mercury or whatever it is, there's a lot of issues that can be caused by plugage of SCRs. Um, an increase in back pressure, which is generally a good indication that there's some serious plugage in your unit, and in including increase in pressure drop, a system pressure drop, a reduction in catalytic efficiency, ammonia slip, uh, poor ammonia distribution, 
frequent catalyst replacement, and like we said earlier, the formation of ammonia bisulfate um, on the air preheaters and uh, preheated fouling, and all these things lend to suboptimal performances with the SCRs. So that's all what led me to try to come up with a solution to way to clean SCRs. There's been a lot of uh, past, how can you say, uh, technology. I know that part of where mine started at where they used to be very uh, commonly used what was called a shaker where they would take a, the modules out of the unit, take them out, set them out, put them on the shaker table and they would shake them loose and get all the dust out of them and then put them back up. And as you can imagine, that's a costly time effect, time consuming process. So, uh, but the fact is that most utilities during the regular seasonal outages tend to just vacuum off the tops of the fly ash off the screens, put the SER back into place without doing anything to really clean the catalyst modules until such time as there becomes an issue with them, whether the issue is large plugage or ammonia slip or other indicators. And so when we, we do that, we suffer a lot of effects of the plug gauge, again, the ammonia, poor ammonia slip and all those things. I think I went backwards there. So most traditional cleaning processes should involve cleaning and scraping the turning vanes, rectifiers, delta wings if you have them. You'd be surprised how many utilities don't actually consider that part of their regular outage maintenance. They just go in there and vacuum them, but they should, especially given the amount of money that's spent on the design of that equipment to make it work the way it should. And, and of course, it also includes vacuuming, should include cleaning the beams off the tops of the screens and hopefully under the screens. But that's a traditional cleaning process that most coal-fired power plants use, and that's where my experience lies is in coal. Um, on a regular outage basis. And so what I did was I came up with a process that carries it beyond that, that where after the screens are removed, some specialized vibrations that are put in situ in the catalyst that are installed on the beams that support the catalyst layers. And uh, if you can imagine, that shakes the ash loose without having to take the modules out of the unit. and it's pretty effective in removing the ash that you couldn't get to with a vacuum and therefore keeping it from building up over a period of time and causing some of the trouble that we've talked about, that we mentioned earlier with catalyst. Um, once that's all done, there's some work done on top to, to remove any crusting, ammonia bisulfate buildup, anything like that that's done. And there's a hood that's put over the top of the catalyst and if you can imagine like the range top over the top of your stove it sits over the top of the catalyst module there's four directed airline redirected airlines in there and uh, four inch vac hose so the process basically involves sucking and blowing while shaking the catalyst to do a dry cleaning process in situ um i uh this is supposed to be a video of those vibrators running, but I'm not able to run the video with this setup. So if anybody's interested in seeing just how effective they are in getting to the ash that you wouldn't get to with the standard vacuuming, it's on my laptop at the table there in the corner of Thompson's table. Um, but it's very, it, how can you say it? I wish I could show it because you could see just how great it really is at removing that ash. And this is an example of uh, the bottoms of the catalyst layers. This is after a, a unit had been cleaned through standard vacuuming, and the rest is after we've come through and done the entire in situ catalyst cleaning process. And again, the process doesn't just involve the vibrators, just the hood. It's really a comprehensive cleaning of the entire unit from the flow wings, uh, from the flow rectifiers, delta wings all that all the way down, tops, bottoms of the cast, the entire callus uh, modules. And as you see here, there's a, some pictures of uh, the tops of the callus before they were vacuumed, and then of course after we've cleaned them, if you can see through the screen, you can see just how clean the callus modules are. Been doing this since 2010, doing it full time, 
and I've never had a, we've never had a damaged catalyst. We've, uh, the cows, no, no cows has ever been damaged. Um, additional equipment is installed from the air that's being blown in them to keep the air dry so we don't have any kind of water or oil, um, how can you say, placed into the catalyst as well as the vibration equipment. And of course, all the men that are there have been trained and knowledgeable in the service. So the results are that you get to capitalize on capital efficiency and remove by removing both the chemical and physical deactivation services, increase in plant efficiency, increase in reduction surfaces, decrease in ammonia slip, decrease in pressure drop, um, catalyst poisoning, and re reduce risk of boiler shutdown. I can tell you this, every one of those things has a cost that's associated with it. When you think about things like um, the the uh, the decrease in pressure drop. Pressure drop has a direct cost associated with it, and uh, callus change out. If you're keeping these things clean on a regular basis when you come in, you're going to vacuum them anyhow, and this process goes together with that vacuum. In other words, you're not paying somebody to come vacuum your unit, and then you're paying us to come shake it. Actually, Thompson now owns the process. I sold to them, and I work as a consultant for them. But what they do is they vacuum the top layer, they, in, they insert this equipment, they shake it, blow it, do the things they're going to do to it, clean that layer, and then they drop to the second layer. So it's all done as part of one process. And uh, here's a result, a testimonial for a job that I did at Thomas Hill Power Plant. And what we did in this job, and uh, it goes on to tell you here on the bottom, that prior to this work that we had challenged the AECI personnel to go in there and clean this unit themselves. They had their own vac trucks, their own maintenance personnel. They took five days to clean the three layers that we came in afterwards. We, again, we did this as our part two-step process just to prove how much better ours was. And so when they had done it, if you see down there, it says that they had done it before, that they had cleaned it before us using traditional methods and that our methods seem to have reduced the plug gauge by 50% on the top two layers and as much as 20 on the third layer. This is a uh, modeling of that unit after they cleaned it. We were, in fact, one of the other vendors that were present here did this modeling for us where it shows the flow between them and the plugage in the layers um, after they had cleaned it using traditional methods. And then, of course, on the other side, you can see how effective our methods are when cleaning some of that plugage. Um, again, we do this as part of a regular cleaning process. Some of the things here that were discussed, whether it's mercury and all these other things that now are coming into play, are, and the systems and where the SERs are located and the role they play in all those things, all those things are based upon optimal SCR performance and it doing what it's going to do. So keeping them clean, doing, the, doing a comprehensive cleaning of the entire system it could affect a lot more than just, uh, say, your NOx, NOx removal, but have a cost-effective basis on everything from pressure drop to, of course, the uh, help with the air heaters. And when you get that ammonia slip through those, through those units, and it happens quite often with unreactor ammonia, and uh, then it's going to foul, it's going to create ABS on the air heater, which has a direct cost associated with that as well. So when we talk about EPA and other considerations, again, we were talking about, uh, we've used this process not just on a regular catalyst cleaning process, like catalyst you're going to put back into service. We've actually cleaned them. We do it quite often for utilities that are going to ship their catalyst out to be regenerated so that to prevent the ash from flying down the road as it's traveling in the truck. In fact, there was a major utility just got fined for that not long ago. And uh, the catalyst regeneration companies have recommended this type of cleaning before sending them off just to prevent the moisture and whatnot from accumulating within them. Um, and then again, there's the a fact that, like I say, the, the, the effect that it has on air heaters, the effect that it may have on mercury removal and whatever system you're using there. So there's a lot of reasons to consider this type of cleaning. Like I say, we've done this over a period of, I've been doing it since 2010 full time. I currently do it um, 
for Kentucky Utilities, LG&E, KU and LG&E. I've been doing it for two and a half years there. It's part, become part of their catalyst management strategy. Every time they come offline, we clean their SCRs. Um, the new ones, the old ones, the ones that are getting shipped out, we've been doing it. And just recently, we've began doing it for several other stations since I joined with Thompson. We've done uh, as many as four jobs in the last five weeks, all very successful. So that's what I had for you. Um, if anybody's interested in seeing the video, and so you can see just how much of this ash we're getting out, like I said, I couldn't play it on here, but my laptop's set up on the table in the other room, so feel free to come by during lunch and take a look at it. Questions about this process and their success? No? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh got to use the microphone. Okay, again, right. I'm, I'm asking my question. Um, how does it compare in cost to the traditional vacuuming? I mean, is it much more expensive? And do you get a longer period of, uh, between cleanings when you use your process compared to just normal vacuum, vacuuming? Well, in, in the, to answer the first part of the question, it's really not tr a, tr a whole lot expensive because, like I say, we're doing it as part of the normal traditional cleaning process. Um, if you would normally be spending $30,000, it may be as much as... 40, 45, I mean, it's kind of hard to gauge, kind of depends on the pile up and what you've got, what you're facing when you get in there, because it is an O&M thing. But when you consider the minimal cost over, over things like the second part of your question, extending the life of the catalyst, not just the end life, but the life between catalyst change outs, then it's nominal. Um, and yes, we, we, it definitely would extend if you think about the ideal that most catalysts that are taken out and shipped off aren't necessarily deactivated or poisoned at that point, 90% of the time they're just plugged. They're, and so if on a regular basis you're coming in and cleaning these catalysts, then you're reducing, and again, I, I invite you to come see the video and see just how much we get out of there that you wouldn't get with the traditional cleaning. And that's just going to grow gradually over the period of time. And, you know, and then it has its effect on a lot of other things, but one of the effects that it has is it causes more and more plug as you get less and less surface area within, within the catalyst to, for the ammonia to react to. And eventually you're shipping them off to get them regen, even if regen ain't necessarily what they, what they need so much as clean. Good, other questions about this process? Okay, well thank you. The good news is